Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries Conference call. Today on our call, we have CEO Derek Webb from BioRem. BioRem trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol BRM and on the OTC under BIRMF. The company is trading at 63 cents with roughly 38 million shares outstanding or about a $24 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Awesome. Thanks, Trevor. Um, yeah, Derek, uh, happy to have you here. Um, we have spoken in the past and we've actually been following the company for a couple years now. So really happy to have you uh, on board for this call. Um, I understand we're going to do a bit of a run and gun session. Um, you're going to give us a a, a, a sort of a, an example or a summary of what the business does, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into some questions. So Derek, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Paul. And, uh, and thank you, Trevor, as well for the introduction to BioRem. I'm uh, very pleased to be here this afternoon, and I uh, hopefully can share a lot of the great things that our firm is doing these days. You know, I'm going to start way back at the beginning, uh, kind of give an overview, because I think that the history is relevant in terms of uh, setting the foundation for who we are and where we can go. And, and I've found that over the years, by staying true to those original fundamental principles, they've kind of guided us in the right direction, and, and they still help make those difficult decisions. So I'll start off with, uh, you know, I define the company as an environmental biotechnology company, which is a, a different nomenclature than is normally used for a capital equipment provider or an environmental air pollution control company. Um, but I think as I get into the discussion a little bit further, you'll have a better understanding for why I differentiate us with the term environmental biotechnology. So BioREM, uh, short for bioremediation, we were founded uh, as an offshoot from the University of Waterloo uh, by one of the professors there who held the chair of industrial microbiology. He had a great idea with uh, some of his students, uh, his graduate students, to, uh, to look at applying novel microbial processes to the remediation of soil. And, um, and that's how our name uh, was created, BioREM, a short for bioremediation. Um, and, and when I joined the company in the mid-90s, we were really struggling to try to commercialize that. You know, the typical story, Canadian technology startup, right? Where do you go to sell? The Canadian market's too small to, to get any traction, uh, but it's very expensive for a, a startup company, especially with new technologies, to try to gain traction overseas or south of the border because your costs are a lot, uh, a, a lot higher in, in executing a project in that manner. So we struggled for a few years uh, to, to make this concept of unique value-add microbial processes to soil remediation, and we just weren't able to compete with uh, the, the landfill costs at the time, dealing with a number of other competitive pressures uh, for a small startup it was very difficult. But what we did have at the time was a large number of very, uh, very smart engineers and scientists we had a complete understanding of microbial kinetics. So we could write mathematical equations to predict the performance of a microbial process. And we started putting our heads together and started saying, well, how can we build a business from this foundation that adds value to, the, to our customer base? And since the, the mid to late 90s, we started looking at gaseous phase emissions. So there's a big, kind of inflection point in the company's history when we said, well, we don't want to just be doing soil now. Can we use the knowledge we have to go after gaseous phase pollutants? And, and that's really where the BioREM story begins. So I, to these days, as I said, we characterize ourselves as an environmental biotechnology firm, but essentially in layman's terms, what we do is we provide full service solutions to deal with air and gas emissions. Now, those emissions might be toxic and lead to health problems. Uh, some, some of the compounds we treat, it's not only long-term cancer-type health problems, but uh, situations where they can be immediately dangerous to life and health. And we run the full gamut all the way down to, to just offensive or nuisance odors. And that's a, a particularly good market for us in, in certain jurisdictions, especially in Canada, where we take quality of life extremely important. As with any environmental company, our business is determined by environmental 
regulations. As uh, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'd like to think people want to do the right thing, do something good for the environment. Ultimately, you, uh, a company, an individual has to be forced or led and that's where the regulations come in. So we, we certainly gravitate towards those markets that are uh, well regulated and well enforced. So just diving back a bit, um, so late 90s now, we started looking at how could we use these models that we had to predict the performance of, of removing these contaminants reliably out of gas streams. And we just started working on that. We started applying it to, uh, to various industries. We've gone after pharmaceutical, petrochemical. We've gone after chemical production, surface coatings. We get in, in into the, uh, the plywoods and the composites and engineered wood products. So essentially any compound that can be biodegraded, that can break down, uh, we can develop a process for. And then we can develop the kinetic models to predict how that performance is going to, uh, to be over the short, medium, and long term. We started doing very well in industrial markets, certainly the uh, agriculture. When, when I say agriculture, everything from, uh, from dead stock facilities to rendering to, you know, after an animal is, is uh, processed with the byproducts that are left, those can be fur further refined down to fertilizers, explosives, into uh, waxes. Uh, so there's a large number of industries that spring out of that whole, what I call agriculture base. And we started doing extremely well on those. The reason why I think we did well, and once again, I'm, I'm kind of harping on this because there's a theme for the company as we move forward. It was how can we add value to this market? And, and it was always going after the most difficult, the most recalcitrant components uh, going after the highest profile projects where you might have, uh, you know, the, uh, the facility might be uh, right next to the mayor's house or the governor's house, where there's a, a lot of focus on ensuring that those emissions don't leave and no one knows what's actually happening in that facility. So we started focusing a lot of our efforts on those types of applications. And that's been our guiding principle ever since. It's why jump into the, the, the same space that everybody else is competing with? There's very little differentiation. Let's go after those difficult applications where there's few people with a known proven solution. And let's see what we can do in those, uh, with those boundaries. And, and we focused on that. So by that, you know, instead of just dealing with coffee roasting, we would be dealing with, you know, rendering plants. Um, and, and that philosophy kind of spread out into other industries. So we started getting into the municipal wastewater uh, treatment uh, sphere. This would have probably been in 99 or 2000. And during that time was once again, the same guiding principles. Everyone is dealing with certain gas removal at a pumping station, but everybody is struggling with removing the very complex odors that are at the back end of a facility that's really handling all of the solids and the sludge at a facility. So there's not very many technologies that can address that. And most, uh, most people have failed at, at, at really achieving high performance rates or reliability on those applications. So we developed processes that could specifically target the compounds that emanated from those wastewater processes. And then we developed the, the models to predict it which allows us to reduce our liability when we provide a warranty. So we know we can do it. The, the models predict we can do it. Um, so I have no problem signing on the dotted line to, to back up our, our, our product or services. From the wastewater sphere, you know, as, as any small startup or Canadian uh, capital equipment vendor will tell you, our business is lumpy. There's no if, ands, or buts, and that's the biggest problem trying to scale up a company like this. Uh, you have lumpy business. Uh, you know, you, you deal with the investment cycles for infrastructure. You deal with the, econo the macroeconomic cycles in terms of uh, where industry allocates their capital. So you have a lot of these factors that come into play that make business very lumpy. And when you're trying to pay the bills, trying to predict, uh, or forecast your manpower requirements, your, uh, your capital requirements, it's a challenge. We've all been there. So we started saying to ourselves, well, how do we deal with that? How, can, we, can we still go back to the principles of who we are, 
environmental biotechnology company, a company that provides value-added services, and can we kind of expand the services we provide or go after a larger market uh, still within those criteria? So we started looking at uh, one of the technologies we had is, is known as biotrickling filters. And, and essentially what we do is we grow bacteria and fungus and, and different molds and yeast. We fix them on the surface of a media. This media could be any type of packing. I mean, we have, BioRam has its own special packing, uh, but uh, people have used shredded tires to, to uh, oyster shells, to, um, to, to plastic rings. There's a variety of material. And we, we basically immobilize the bacteria on the surface. As the contaminant in the gas passes across this media, uh, the, the contaminant becomes the food source for those microorganisms. And they break it right down to water and carbon dioxide. So very few uh, negative byproducts are actually generated from this process. So we had this biotrickling filter technology that was well established on wastewater. And we started seeing a big problem, you know, as uh, in, in the mid 2000s and uh, towards the end of the 2000s, you had a real drive for looking for alternative uh, fuel sources, getting away from fossil fuels. And, um, and then you also had a, a coinciding problem with landfills uh, quickly filling up across the continent. So there became a real big push for renewable energy, biogas or landfill gas. But the problem with that gas, it's a tremendous resource. It's a tremendous resource uh, that, that, that certainly has been overlooked in the past. And I'm, I'm quite heartened to see a, a focus as we continue on in, in, in the 20s here that um, renewable uh, methane gas mixtures are gonna be a, a big part of the energy mix. But part of the problem with this gas is it's highly contaminated. A lot of moisture, a lot of carbon dioxide and a lot of hydrogen sulfide. So what we started doing is saying, well, hey, there's, you've got a new market here where we can apply the technology we have, but modify it to work in the absence of oxygen in one of these gas mixtures. So with a bit of, uh, a bit of work, a few years of work, uh, both uh, at, the, at the lab scale, as well as out directly out in the field on, on live projects, uh, we were able to develop a biological process to remove the hydrogen sulfide from gas streams. And it can do so probably compared to any other technology that's available, it does so the most economically as well. So this is a rare convergence where you've got an ideal technology that's a uh, low capital cost, but very low operating cost and performs extremely well. So that convergence, we were able to open up a new market. Coinciding with that, we said, well, you know, while 80% of Canada's business is south of the border, we have to diversify, right? You never know which president's gonna go in, what policies are gonna be enacted, which is a pretty relevant discussion these days. Um, but you, you know, you, you need to build your business to weather that kind of storm. And we started looking at other countries. So as, a, as of today, we, we operate in 23 countries across the world, pretty well every single continent. Um, and, uh, and we work not only in the municipal sector in these 23 countries, but we also look at industrial seg segments. So full range of uh, differentiation. So we've got uh, a product that, that can be used across multiple industries in multiple geographical regions. And we tend to pick these regions based on, once again, a convergence of market factors, such as economics, uh, regulations, enforcement of regulations, as well as, um, as the presence of competition. So we look for a convergence of these factors and then we just, we take a, the template that we've used for all of these years and we apply it to each of the new market areas. You know, some of the most exciting developments uh, in, in the recent months uh, was following this model where we've just developed a new microbial process uh, for the semiconductor industry. So working uh, closely with Samsung in, in South Korea, we were able to develop a process to achieve the results they needed for those gas emissions um, without all of the negatives that they had with the technologies, the conventional technologies they were employing. And we've just finished a year-long uh, development project with them that was successful. 
Um, and at the end of that, they've, they've actually purchased the unit that we used for the demonstration. So we're, uh, we're quite um, optimistic about uh, being able to take what we've learned on the semiconductor process now and apply that uh, in China and in other areas and, and kind of work with Samsung at, at some of their other facilities. So it's a, it's a tried and true model that we've, we've uh, tried to, to employ over all of these years. But the underlying focus, once again, is always about creating value for our customers. If we're just doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, there's no point. But that's not who we are. And then finally, the, the, the latest, I guess, uh, evolution in, in BioRAM's uh, development is moving away from the environmental biotechnology aspect yet providing the same high degree of engineering and design and quality, but looking at other technologies, other services uh, that we can provide into the sphere. And uh, you'll be, uh, your audience and uh, our shareholders will be pleased to know that we'll be introducing a new product line of, uh, of new technologies, but literally within coming days to weeks. Um, so we're expanding out of the biological and, uh, and using, going, using that same lens of focus, uh, looking at physical, chemical, and thermal solutions as well. So I guess where we're headed, we're, the, the path that we're going is, is using this foundation, but with the ultimate goal of becoming a full service provider for our customers across the globe. I think that, that kind of gives you just a, a quick history and introduction to Byram and how they how they kind of tie together. I, I thought it might be a good introduction to, to some of the questions I might be fielding. I, I think you did a fantastic, that, that is probably the best presentation without a presentation that we've ever had. So, <laughs> so good job. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, no problem, no problem. Um, you know, there, there, there's obviously a lot of excitement, a lot of interest from the investment community about, you know, any, anything sort of ESG or environmental. So it's, you guys obviously play within that sphere. Um, I'm, I'm very interested to hear more about the new product and, and sort of new category you guys are going after. But um, with the existing product you have right now, can you give us a, a sense of what your sort of total addressable market is? So the, 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 uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, North America for a second, and we'll look at uh, the municipal wastewater market. Uh, depending which of the studies you look at, um, you know, there's a number of studies out there, and the, the range is massive. So what I do is I look at these studies, but I compare it with the, just the, the hands-on knowledge that we have. So we track every single public project uh, related to water, wastewater, or solid waste in North America. And once you start putting in all of the ancillaries for those projects, the estimated odor control portion of that market is between two and 300 million annually. Now you have to digest those numbers carefully. Um, because within that market, it's really split almost a third, a third, and a third on the three technologies. So you have biological, you have physical, and you have chemicals, and they roughly split up that, that municipal market about in thirds. And then you have to further break that down because those numbers include all of the ancillaries, right? That's the installation cost, that's the ductwork to carry, uh, the foul air over to your equipment. It might be um, the covers required if, if a facility has a large uh, uh, storage tank. Well, the cost to cover it, to contain and then collect it is also in these numbers. So, it, but, but it's still a, a significant market and that's just North America municipal. Uh, we estimate the industrial segment to be about the same, a little bit less, but about the same in North America. And then we, we look at the global markets at being uh, roughly at a billion in odor control for municipal mm -hmm. with, with the same caveats once again, but, yeah. but those are just general numbers. Okay. And what, what does a traditional sale look like? What's your average sale price for, for a unit or an installation? Uh, recently that's been cha uh, changing and, and moving upwards, which is a good thing for us. Um, because it takes the same amount of manpower and resources for us to deliver a $1 million job as a $50,000 job. So when I see the average uh, project value increasing, that's good news because we can handle a larger number of projects 
uh, at, at the exact same fixed cost. So that's a very positive thing. Right now, we're hovering around the $250,000 range as, a, as an average. Um, but that range is anywhere from $10,000. Now, we don't sell a lot of those at, at $10,000, but it, the range is roughly from about $10,000 to the largest one we've sold is $6 million. So it's, it's a pretty significant range. Um, you know, but, but uh, certainly what we're seeing is a larger number. We, uh, we just lost your sound. If you want to check your mic. There we go. You're back. Yeah, that's odd. It did it on its own. Yeah, it was a little weird. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So we didn't, we didn't catch the last five seconds of what you were saying there. So um, Yeah, I guess I was just uh, commenting on the size of the project. So it's, uh, it's certainly nice to see a shift towards having a much larger number of large projects being tendered rather than a ridiculous number of tiny projects being tendered. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so you mentioned wastewater. Obviously, most of the wastewater facilities are, are run by either municipalities or some other government organization. But do you do anything into the industrial market, um, sort of the, the, call it the private market? Do, do you sell anything to there? Yes, absolutely. And, and once again, that's cyclical. Um, you know, North America has never recovered from 07, 08 in terms of manufacturing. So the industrial side has been relatively uh, suppressed. Um, but we still do uh, the odd jobs, about anywhere from 10 to 30% of our revenue in a given year will go to industrial projects. What we're seeing us is we're seeing BioRem handle a lot more of these projects overseas. Um, we've just delivered, I think it was our, either our seventh or eighth project with Sinopec. Uh, one of the world's largest gas companies, uh, oil and gas companies in China. We've just delivered that one. Um, we've just delivered another one actually also in China for McCormick Foods, uh, a very large food processing company. Um, and at this particular facility, they make it, um, it's very similar to what we would uh, as, as chicken broth, like dehydrated chicken broth. Um, so we've done those types of things. We've, uh, we've gotten into soybean processing. Um, once again, it's about following where the economy or the manufacturing is and trying to target those segments that, that we add value. Yeah, perfect. Um, Derek, uh, I usually save the uh, sort of listeners uh, questions until later, but there's one that sort of touched on something you just said. Um, have you been approached by anyone in the oil sands business um, uh, for, for any of this sort of stuff? Not for many, many years. Okay. Um, I think just uh, given the, uh, the the low oil prices right now, there's the investment and certainly the investment for, for emissions is, is going to be uh, suppressed. Right. Uh, but about a decade ago, there was a, few, a couple of applications where people came to us, but they never amounted to much. Okay, gotcha. The, you know, when you, when you look at biological systems, what you're really looking for are, are difficult to degrade compounds, but you're looking for relatively low concentrations. If there's too much food, let's say, in the air, the bacteria just go crazy. They proliferate like mad, and you have all kinds of, of trouble con controlling their growth. So typically, our, our solutions for bi biological solutions typically prefer lower concentration applications. So we, we, can, we can work within the oil and gas sector, but in a very narrow area with, with these types of solutions. Um, okay, so you're, I mean, I'll call yourself a relatively small or you know, Canadian listed company, but give us a sense of what the competitive landscape looks like. Are you up against similar sized companies? You're up against major companies? Give us a sense of what you, uh, you fight against. For the most part, um, we are against smaller companies. It's, it's a very fragmented market. Um, but once again, that's, it, we, we have to look at the context of the geographic market. We have to look at the context of the industrial segment um, and the technology we're looking at. So if we gravitate towards more of the VOCs and the industrial markets, now our, our primary competitors will be extremely large multinational global companies that deal with thermal oxidation. So if I'm going after 
uh, let's say, well, it, you know, Samsung would be a good example at, or Sinopec where you've got uh, your established com competition is from thermal oxidation. We could be dealing against, you know, some of the largest German companies. If I'm dealing on wastewater in the US, I probably have a dozen smaller companies um, that typically disappear every five to 10 years and get reinvented. Um, so it's, it's very dynamic. It's a very competitive market. Um, but I'd say, you know, out of that dozen of these smaller companies, there's probably only one, maybe two that, that, that I would actually put on the same level as Bioram or, or mm -hmm. just below us, of course. Yeah. Um, so explain to me a little bit about your revenue model, because I, I get the impression that you guys, you, you sell a big unit and maybe there's some maintenance uh, revenue or some parts revenue, but um, is, there, is there anything more to that? Give, give me a sense of the revenue model. Sure. Uh, primarily the, the revenue model is based on selling equipment. Um, you know, probably 90 to 95% of our revenue is earned from providing a piece of equipment. Um, however, that does present itself as a, as a great opportunity for further expansion, something that we have been investing a lot of time and money in and will continue to do so. So there's a, there's a component of service that can be applied to maintain these systems, to operate these systems, um, to troubleshoot them, to operate other people's, the competitor systems. So there's a, there's a service component uh, that is increasing. Give you an idea. I think in 2019, we were roughly about one, one and a half million in revenue. So out of the 20, 20, 20 million or so, 25 million. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of other services that we're looking at expanding in as well. And, and, and they fall more under the traditional consulting services. Mm -hmm. So going to a site and doing an emissions assessment. So going to the site, finding out where is the issue, quantifying that issue and providing a solution for that issue. So we've started expanding into that area and we're kind of lumping all of that into the, the whole service aspect of the business. So we hope to see that grow as, as we continue. And uh, maybe we talk a little bit about your sales cycle. I mentioned, you know, the bigger, the bigger units that you're selling probably have a, a long lead time. Um, maybe, yeah, so the sales cycle and how, how, you know, what's the turnaround when you get an order, how fast do you deliver? A massive range on both of those, anywhere from uh, three months to 10 years. Wow. Um, you know, the, uh, the recent uh, press releases on the, uh, on the large um, projects in Montreal, they were over 10 years in mm. getting us to that, that final order. And it's uh, for delivery, it's a little faster. But anywhere from three to three months to three years. Now the average is much lower, though, right? But um, you know, so, so if you're you're really looking at it, I'd be saying it's it's a year and a year for a sales cycle and for delivery of a product. You're you're roughly on on a one year average. And, and give me a sense too. Um, are you are you dealing with a lot of RFPs or are you sort of knocking on doors saying, hey, you guys need to you know, install one of these things? How, how are you selling this stuff? We do both. Uh, we take a, a slightly different, more arduous, more time-consuming approach than most of our comp competitors do. And we look at the full uh, triangle of state stakeholders. So we look at the regulators. We look at the end users, the people that are actually going to be operating the equipment. We look at contractors. We look at who funds the project. You know, because a lot of times uh, your, your design build team, they're just looking for the lowest capital cost to install, period. Uh, but the guys putting funding in the project, the guys putting in money cannot risk having that facility shut down a year after it's built. So, you know, it, each one of these stakeholders has a much different uh, outlook on what they think is important. So we try to work all of the different stakeholders. It's just, it's a lot of work. Um, but it's the only way to, to, to be successful at this. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, any, any sort of marquee clients you can talk to and, and mention? Well, we, we, we have them all. So, you know, and this actually ties into uh, maybe the answer from before in terms of what our revenue model was, because I think part of the answer, uh, some of your subscribers may be wondering, well, is there a recurring revenue portion of this? 
Sure. And, and BioRev does have recurring revenue, but in a very non-traditional way. So, and I'll give you an example. If, if you're bidding a municipal uh, tender, uh, typically these processes that the municipality hires a consultant to manage the tender. Mm -hmm. Well, if you develop a relationship, A, with the municipality and B, with the consultant, and if you execute those projects well, well, they are your repeat revenue. It just doesn't come from that one job. It's, you know, if I look at ACOM or I look at Jacobs, you know, two of the largest consulting firms on the planet, I, I forget the exact numbers, anywhere from 300 to 500,000 employees each. Um, we've probably done two, 300 projects with each of them. So while we don't have recurring revenue in, in the traditional sense, I really look at, at those relationships and the foundation and, and, and the performance we do on those jobs as getting us those next orders with that family. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, in, you know, in terms of municipalities, essentially every major city municipality on the continent has a biorem system. So, you know, if I look at the city of Toronto, I'd say 80% of their systems is biorem. If I look at uh, Chicago, uh, we're probably getting up to the 30, 40% range. You know, so we, we tend to go to areas, we do our job well and, and try to get that repeat business. So uh, essentially all of these cities carry us. I mean, we even have a biorem system at the gates to Petra in Jordan. Um, so for some of your subscribers, you know, it's not officially a, a wonder of the world, but it really should be. But as you go there, these millions of, of tourists that, that visit every year, um, would actually get to see a biorem system as they're waiting to enter uh, the archaeological uh, dig. So uh, pretty interesting from that viewpoint. Yeah. And then, you know, in terms of industry, it's a who's who, right? We've done work with Samsung, Sabic, Axo Nobel, Kraft, uh, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, um, Unilever. You know, the, the names go on and on. So we, we are well established with a large number of industries as well. Now, um, do you manufacture in Canada? Give me a sense of where you put all these uh, pieces together. We do that everywhere. Uh, this is, uh, our, our market is global. And mm -hmm. if I'm building something in, in Canada and trying to ship it to India, there's no way I can compete. So what we've learned is having a global supply chain and, um, and, and we, can, we can play with those pieces based on currency exchange, as well as where the projects are going. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, but our primary three countries for manufacturing are Canada, the US and China. Now, um, COVID, um, how have you guys uh, had to change, if anything, how you operate your business? And, and has it has COVID uh, provided more opportunities or is it, is it provided less opportunities for you in the, in the long run? Well, for the long run, that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say about uh, 2020 and uh, 2021 is that every challenge presents an opportunity. And, um, and whenever something like this happens, you have to take a moment and look at, okay, well, how can we do business? You know, you start looking at, parts of your business that normally don't get much attention. And uh, while BioRem is uh, considered a, an essential business in, in every country that we operate in, we've gone above and beyond and we've taken the steps to, to essentially shut down our, our in-person offices. Um, a lot of our work can be done remotely and we've outfitted all of our, all of our staff with the proper equipment to be able to work from home efficiently. Uh, this was a bit of a trial run to see if we would lose some, some productivity, but what we've actually seen over the last year is our productivity has increased. So with our staff, our employees not having to commute one to two hours a day, what we've been seeing is they've actually been contributing that extra one to two hours a day into the company. Uh, we've always been flexible. We always believe in, in, in people having time for their families. And we've, we've allowed our, our employees to, um, to kind of manage their time and how they want to get this work done in a manner that has increased productivity, uh, but gives them more flexibility. What we've also seen as well is that 
not only can we maintain our productivity working from home, we've noticed that we've got another big need. So there's one thing to, to stay at home and do your, your design in front of a computer, but we have to start up these systems. Or if a client has a problem, we have to send a, a, you know, a technical representative to the site to try to conduct an investigation and, and determine what occurred. When you're working in 23 countries and in every state and province, that becomes difficult when you've got a pandemic uh, and you've got different rules in different regions that are changing all the time. So that's been a, a little bit of a, an adjustment, but because we've got operations in the US, we have offices in, in Atlanta, in New York, and then we also have the, uh, the, the Toronto area office here uh, just outside of Guelph. Um, that gives us a little bit of flexibility to, to, to not worry as much about the cross border. I mean, we can still cross the border if we had to, but we've tried to figure out a way to do it without that. And, and we've just kind of rejigged some of the, uh, the pieces in terms of human resources to enable us to do that. And then furthermore, we've just embraced technology. Um, there's a number of technological innovations that have come up in the last several years that, that people just left on shelves um, that we're now embracing and using that's reducing our costs, improving our efficiency. Um, so overall, COVID has actually been a positive thing for us from that viewpoint. My concern is more long-term, right? We talked about our sales cycle being, you know, one to 10 years. Well, 2020 will have, you know, COVID will have no impact on, on us on 2020. In all likelihood, most of 21 has already been set from 2018, 2019, and 2020. So I'm not too concerned about this year. Um, I'm more concerned about the long-term future. People buy from people. Uh, there's, there's just no substitute for looking someone in the eye. You build that trust a lot faster. I, I, I'm probably sounding old, and I know there's a lot of millennials on, on the line here saying, hey, you don't need to see someone in person. But you know what? You, you don't. Um, and, and certainly with our credibility, you don't, but it really speeds up that, that familiarity, that process of gaining trust. Um, and when you can laugh with someone, I, it just goes a long way. So long-term, I'm hoping that uh, COVID doesn't have a, a big impact on our sales, uh, but that, that is my one concern, I'll be honest. Okay, perfect, thanks, Derek. Um, I wanna remind everybody, if you do have questions that I haven't asked, uh, feel free to use the chat function and uh, fire the questions and I'll do my best to, to ask Derek the question. Um, let's take a slightly different tact. Um, you, you guys have been growing uh, organically over the last you know, year, well, several years, but um, any opportunities for M&A? Do you, do you guys look at possibly um, adding through um, some acquisitions? Well, absolutely. Uh, that's a good question, Paul. Um, as you can tell, we've got a fairly decent balance sheet and uh, you know, it, it's always good to have a war chest of, of, of dollars there to, to deal with slow times. But I think we've progressed beyond that. Um, our working capital is at, at, at an all time high. And so if I part that aside, there's a need to do something with that capital, right? But the flip side of it is we're working, we're, we're operating in a mature fragmented market with a lot of competition. So if we want to continue to create value for our shareholders, we need to also look at an inorganic growth strategy. It can't just be growth or organic growth. So management is looking at both opportunities in front of us. Um, you know, from the organic side, as I said, we've got some new products, some, some new services. Uh, but on the inorganic side, we're looking at a number of things from, from M&A activity uh, to some other interesting things that we're considering. So it's... Uh, uh, we were hoping that 2020 would have been the year that uh, some of these initiatives would have come to fruition, but, um, you know, we're still forging ahead and, and pretty confident that we'll, uh, we'll get something done in, in the foreseeable future. Uh, speaking to your sort of financial strength, um, you, you also have a very large shareholder who has a significant vested interest in the business. Can you talk a little bit about that, that large shareholder and sort of why and what they bring to the table? Absolutely. Um, so the company in, in English is known as, uh, as TUS. I'm just going to use TUS because it's, it's a very convoluted ownership structure. Um, but essentially, this was a strategic investment for them. 
they they are about a 80 billion US dollar company uh, with about 800 subsidiaries. But the vast majority of those subsidiaries are in the environmental sector. They were extremely well represented on, on uh, solid waste, on water treatment, wastewater treatment, uh, and, and from every aspect you could possibly imagine. Between three of their subsidiaries, they owned and operated over a hundred wastewater or solid waste facilities in China. So the idea here was they saw BioRem, they saw that BioRem had a, a footstep in China already. Uh, we had an install base, uh, we were culturally aware and we had the infrastructure already in place, uh, but certainly struggling to get it to the next level. Uh, and they saw a company with a, a Canadian company with a very strong reputation worldwide. They looked at all the, the competition and came back to us because of the convergence of those things and said, you know, you're the company we want to bring in to this family to handle the air and gas side of things. So the, the idea, the concept was always about, let's get BioRem. We don't have good representation on air and gas uh, remediation. Uh, let's bring them in and let's help them grow in China. That, that, that basically was the concept. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so I, I guess in line with that question, uh, give us a, a, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the stock, um, insider ownership and the makeup of sort of the shareholder base that you guys have. You, you have all the good questions today, Paul. <laughs> I um, try, I try, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, that's, that's the issue. You know, the TUS has been a great shareholder. Uh, they've been great to work with. I personally, uh, like many of the individuals uh, that I've been with, they're, they're just accomplished professionals. Um, and they've, they've allowed, they've trusted management to execute the strategy we feel is best. The, the dark side or the negative side of, of this ownership structure that we have, though, is, is really, it, it translates into liquidity. And, and that's been something that's, uh, that, that's been holding us back, in my opinion. So between, if I look at TUS with roughly 60%, and if I look at uh, friends and managers and employees, uh, that's probably another 20 to 25%. So out of the, the roughly 38 million shares that are outstanding, you've got a very large portion of those shares being tightly held. And I think that, uh, that's been dragging our, our value down. And, and certainly it is a, a hot topic of discussion as we, we forge forward into 21. Um, and it's a, it's a discussion that's being held uh, not only at management level, but at the board level in terms of what options are available to deal with this. Um, and how does that play in, into an inorganic growth strategy as well? So that's what I'm saying. It's a, a lot of very exciting opportunities in front of us. And we've got the foundation to go after it and we have the bandwidth to go after these. So it's, uh, as I head into 21 with a stay at home order, I'm actually quite optimistic. Awesome. Um, well, I, listen, I, I think we're sort of coming up to the end of uh, the presentation here. Um, there, there is a question which sort of lines itself up with what I usually wrap everything uh, up with, but uh, we've got someone who's asked, what's your overarching vision or your big, hairy, audacious goal is for the company? Yeah, I thought we've, been, uh, we've never wavered from that goal. It's to become the global full service uh, engineering solutions provider. Uh, we want to be not only on every continent, we want to be in every major capital on the planet. We want to be able to be the one stop shop for any solution you have. You don't know what your problem is? Come to BioRam. We'll help you get there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what your problem is? Okay, well, I've got these three solutions depending on the commercial and technical needs of that application. I'm looking at having full. Uh, full services in terms of recurring revenue. So I'm looking for a full package here, uh, but primarily focused on air and gas emissions. Perfect. Okay, so then I will ask you one last question. It may, you may have answered it, but what, what we always like to do is if there was one key sort of takeaway you want all our listeners to, to walk away from this uh, in our call today, what would be that one key takeaway? 
Uh, optimism, the key, you know, the fundamentals are there, Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been with this company for a long time. I, I sit on a large number of boards and I see how companies in our space and our size are. No one has the balance sheet that BioRM currently has. So the fundamentals are just, they're staggering. This is the best I've ever seen. They're a great foundation. We've got the reputation. We've got a record high in backlog. We've got the, we've got the working capital to enable us to do something. And we have a highly qualified professional board that believes in management and is working to assist us to enact these strategies. So for me, the takeaway is optimism. I know that there's, I'm sure there's a lot of our long-term shareholders on this call right now that, uh, that have been very patient with us, but they want to see some value created. And, and you know, I, I think we're seeing a convergence of these things. So my takeaway is optimism, optimism, optimism. Awesome, Derek. Listen, we love companies that are helping uh, helping clean up the environment um, and and dealing with uh, some of the, the issues that you guys help deal with. Um, I, you know, I, I've seen your shares or your stock price start to rise, so obviously you're starting to resonate with investors. And um, certainly, it was great to catch up with you today to get a good understanding of the story. Um, I want to thank you uh, for joining us today and uh, look forward to catching up with you in the future. Um, but before I go, if somebody needs more information, uh, what's your website or, or possibly a contact uh, point for, for more, um, more, more info? Sure, the, uh, the website is biorem.biz, B-I-Z or B-I-Z. And, um, and then you can reach out to me uh, personally at dweb, so D-W-E-B-B, at biorem.biz. And I'm, I'm always available, either myself or my CFO, Doug Newman. We love to chat with, uh, with people. We love to share the good things we're doing. Um, so feel free, anyone, to just pick up the phone, call us, email us. We're here to help. Awesome. Uh, Derek Webb, CEO of Byron, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, and have yourself a great day.